Today's episode is brought to you by Wandrium. Many of us are familiar with the Knights Templar, or simply the Templars, a Catholic military order formed in the mid 12th century who rose to surprising heights of power in such a short space of time. The Knights themselves were often thought to be some of the most skilled warriors in the Crusades, and donning foreboding armor, those that were not without their distinct white mantles bearing the Red Cross, they were certainly a force to be reckoned with, and not one you'd want to be on the bad side of. But most of the Templars weren't actually fighters, but were instead more like financiers, and those more interested in the economic infrastructure throughout not just their own Christian kingdom, but the rest of the world too. In fact, it can be argued that given the global reach of the Templars during their century-long operation, they were the first multinational corporation. But when the Holy Land was lost, and support for the Order waned, rumours about the Templars began to circulate. Those very rumours which came to cast a most ominous and spine-chilling shadow around this most suspicious group. In fact, these rumours became so palpable that King Philip IV of France, who happened to also be in debt to the Order, took advantage of the Templars decline, and seeking to erase his debts, had many of the Templars arrested, tortured and executed. After harassing Pope Clement V for long enough, the Pope disbanded the Templar Order, but those rumours that had permeated the air would live long throughout the ages, and spur on speculation that the Templars were far more sinister than one might have realised, perhaps even owing to the supernatural. Amongst those rumours was the idea that the Knights Templar worshipped not the Christian god to whom their operations seemed to revolve around, but instead a more fiendish and hellish deity known as Baphomet. Today's video is brought to you by Wondrium. You've heard me talk about The Great Courses Plus before. Well, the folks behind The Great Courses are making big moves to create even better, broader, bigger, and mind-blowing educational experiences, and giving you even more reasons to love learning. Enter Wondrium, where you can find all of the tried and true Great Courses Plus content and more. Wondrium is a subscription on-demand video learning service that features lectures and courses from some of the top professors around the world, some even from the Ivy League and other prestigious universities. You'll also find courses run by experts from the National Geographic, the Smithsonian and the Culinary Institute of America. By signing up to Wondrium, you can gain access to a library of over 11,000 videos and lectures about, well, pretty much anything, from science, maths, history, literature, or even the more creative arts, like photography. If you're enjoying hearing about the demons in my recent videos, you might like to explore the origins and the theme of evil within various religions, and a really insightful course that supports this is Why Evil Exists, by Charles Matthews. Why Evil Exists dives into the concept of evil throughout human history, and examines both the historical and religious nature of evil in each video. There's such a huge selection to choose from Wondrium, and so I'm sure you won't have any difficulty finding something that tickles your fancy. You can access Wondrium via your PC, tablet, or even your phone, and you can learn university-grade content at your own pace. Right now, Wondrium are offering a free trial, so if you love learning as much as I do, be sure to head over to wondrium.com slash thelegendsofhistory to gain access to a lecture library of over 10,000 videos, or hit the link in the description below. And now back to Baphomet. Amongst the crimes that the Templars were accused of, some were more outrageous than others. Accusations of the usual heresy, homosexual activity, and spitting and or urinating on the cross were all quite typical. But the latter of these crimes, the spitting and urinating on the cross, 
were thought by some historians to have actually been conducted by the Templars so as to mentally prepare them for violations that they might have been forced to commit should they have been captured. But interestingly, there exist accounts that the spitting on the cross was also a ritual commanded by the cult of Baphomet, and that this was seen as an initiation process within the Knights Templar. With this idea, the Templars, or at least a sect of them, were not actually Christians, and were using the image of Christ as a guise for much more sinister antics. In his book, The Knights Templar and Their Myth, Peter Partner states that one of the main accusations made against the Templars was their worship of the deity Baphomet, but that the descriptions of Baphomet varied from confession to confession, leading many to believe that the Templars who were accused of this were tortured for their admissions until they just made something up. Some were resolute in their denial of Baphomet and explained that they knew nothing of this deity, but others would confess that they had worshipped the deity and described him as being anything between a severed head to a being with three faces. Others spoke of it taking a zoomorphic form and possessing limbs and features incongruent with the standardised image of God. Yet despite these accusations, there did not seem to be any concrete evidence from this time period that suggests the Templars were in league with Baphomet further suggesting that those who confessed did so out of desperation to end their suffering. Another idea proposes that the Templar knights who were posted in the Crusader states had come to adopt Islamic doctrine into their own beliefs, and either discovered a dual faith or had outright converted. This would of course have been viewed as the utmost heresy in a time where medieval Christians believed that Muslims were idolaters and that the Prophet Muhammad was a false prophet. In fact, Muhammad would have been referred to as Mahomet in Old French, and by some, it was believed that the name Mahomet was at some point transformed into Baphomet. Mahomet would also become Mamet in Old English, and as one might imagine, it would become the definition of a false god. It might also be the case that Baphomet had a more Byzantine Greek influence, and that the name Baphomet originated from the Greek name for Muhammad, Mohameth. This is further substantiated by the fact that the Templars were exposed to Greek culture in the First Crusade, and would have come to learn of Mohameth and the sinister reputation he had amongst the contemporary Greeks. Biblical scholar Hugh J. Schoenfield argues in his book, The Essene Odyssey, that the word Baphomet came about with the Atbash substitution cipher in mind, a complex system which replaces the first letter of the alphabet for the last, and the second for the second last, and so on. Using this system, the word Baphomet becomes Sophia, which can be interpreted as the name Sophia, meaning wisdom. With this, not only does Baphomet become a more androgynous figure, as the name Sophia is adopted, but also comes to stand for sagacity and intelligence, elements that perhaps the Templars were keen to absorb. Another idea regarding the Templars' association with Baphomet comes from a belief that the Templars were actually Gnostics, and thus subscribed to polytheism. Of course, Baphomet was thought to be one of these deities that they worshipped, though given their secrecy, it's possible that this was kept under wraps so as to avoid public outcry and political admonishing. Furthermore, some ideas, chiefly from VNS Orientalist Jacob Freiherr von Hammer Perkstall, suggest that Baphomet was indeed an androgynous figure, based on various stone antiquities that share the same name. These Baphomets were thought to be hermaphrodites and possessed additional limbs or even features that were placed in unconventional places. Hammer still argued that many of these stone Baphomets were inscribed with Arabic, furthermore suggesting an Islamic origin. But this link is hard to determine. 
There are also claims by Hammer Perkstall that the Templars carried these Baphomets in their luggage, and that these were indeed articles that served as idols. But again, these claims are almost certainly born out of assumption. By the mid 19th century, Baphomet would become popularized by the French esotericist and poet Eliphas Levy, who likened Baphomet to that of the Sabbatic goat. In fact, in his book, Dogma and the Rituals of High Magic, he illustrated his own idea of Baphomet that would become known as the Goat of Mendis. It's likely that this followed the account by Greek writer and geographer Herodotus, who spoke of the god of Mendis, Mendes being an Egyptian city, as having a goat's face and a goat's legs. Levy depicts the deity as a winged humanoid goat, that much like Hammer Perkstall's idea, also possessed breasts, and thus adopted a more androgynous form. There was also a torch spotted atop the goat's head, where the sign of a pentagram can also be found. Baphomet's hands are also positioned to form the sign of the occult, according to Levy, with one hand pointing up to promote kindness and love, and the other pointing down to promote judgment and limitation. It was believed by Levy that the positioning of Baphomet's hands promoted the perfect harmony between mercy and justice, one hand that expressed love and the other which expressed judgment. One of his arms is female, and the other is male, yet again incorporating the blend of both sexes, and forming something of a representation for everyone in existence. The torch positioned between his horns was thought to either be symbolic for intelligence, or symbolic for the soul itself, which through Baphomet could elevate beyond the physical state. Levy tells us himself in Dogma and Rituals of High Magic, the beast's head expresses the horror of the sinner. The rod standing instead of genitals symbolizes eternal life. The body covered with scales, the water. The semicircle above it, the atmosphere. The feathers following above, the volatile. Humanity is represented by two breasts, and the androgyn arms of this sphinx of the occult sciences. The depiction of Baphomet by Levy was also believed to have been a symbol for a more heretical tradition that existed outside of typical religious belief, and that the symbol stood for the emancipation of humanity and a perfect social order. He would also come to speak of his own belief in the astral light, that shone from between the horns of Baphomet that which was a magical light that promoted the progressive idea of blending religion and science, or at least advocated a social system that championed both religion and science without one impeding the other. But many might be wondering why a goat was used for Baphomet's face at all, other than the possible inspiration that Levy may have drawn from Herodotus. Well, Herodotus did speak of goats being revered creatures in Egypt, and that by one of his observations, he saw a woman having sex with one. Thus was the prominence of the goat in the region of Mendes. Furthermore, some goats that were worshipped were even believed to have been given ceremonial burials when they died, and that public mourning of the goat was not uncommon. Fans of Aleister Crowley might also be interested to know that the occultist recognized Baphomet as the hieroglyph of arcane perfection, and that this deity was a reflection of ourselves. Baphomet would become an important figure within Crowley's cult of Thelema in the early 20th century, and he would also be recognized by Crowley's writing as an androgynous being that stood for life and love. As anyone who studied Crowley for more than a minute, you'll know that sex magic played an integral role in his beliefs, and according to Crowley, Baphomet was also symbolic of the magical child that was produced through such sex magic. With this in mind, 
it was believed by Crowley that Baphomet represented the convergence of opposites, especially in this instance, where the magically infused child would be conceived through the physical act of sex. Both magic in the ritualistic copulation and the biological fusing of sperm and egg would in a sense become a representation of Baphomet, he who resembled opposites. Interestingly, this is not the first time that Baphomet has been addressed as a deity who marries up the opposite elements, for Levi himself in his illustration of the goat of Mendis details him as having the Latin word solve, meaning dissolve, on one arm and the Latin word coagula, meaning coagulate, on the other. Yet again supporting the idea of two opposites coinciding. But let me know of any tales that you might have heard in regards to Baphomet in the comments below. And as always, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.